The end of election season is in sight, but not before the campaigns and candidates conduct a final cash-driven charge. Well, I don't think there's any question, but the influx of money as a result of Citizens United has given both campaigns and all these super PACs the dollars necessary to buy many more television ads. It's never been this bad, and I think if this trend continues, we're going to be sitting here four years from now saying, it's never been this bad. Tonight on Arizona Week, we follow the money in politics and look at the polemics that money has produced. Production of Arizona Week is made possible in parts by a grant from the Stonewall Foundation and by the members of Arizona Public Media. Thank you for your continued support. Once again, your moderator, Michael Chiha. Six billion dollars spent on the presidential race, 40 million for U.S. Senate in Arizona, and millions more for congressional seats. If money is the fuel of politics, this election season is running on high octane. Where is it coming from? How is it being spent? And what are we getting for it? We'll start with an update on campaign finance from Arizona Public Media political correspondents Andrea Kelly and Christopher Conover. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. First, the rules, Buzz. What are they? Very simple rules, actually. $2,500 is the most that an individual can give for either the primary or the general. So that means 5000 total during an election cycle per candidate. And as it comes to political action committees, they can only give 5000 to a candidate. Again, 5000 in the primary, 5000 in the general, which is, of course, where we are now. And uh, political action committee giving also has a different dimension to it, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Absolutely. Andrea, the time frame we're talking about here? We looked at reports going back through the last time we talked about campaign finance was the end of, Ju of June. So we looked at reports that covered July, August, September, and a little bit of spending in October, which is the latest information we have. And actually, the last reports we will get through Election Day. We won't get any more numbers before Tuesday. And Christopher, $40 million being spent in the Senate race in Arizona, Carmona versus Flake. Where's that money coming from? It's coming from all over. The candidates have spent, uh, as of the dates that we can see the reports from, almost $21 million between uh, the candidates. The rest of that comes from outside groups. We are seeing lots and lots of ads from different political action committees and 527s. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the Google ads that you see if you're searching Google from Arizona, we see a lot of uh, Carmona and Flake ads. Most of those are from outside groups, not from the campaigns. And the campaigns don't have control over those and, in fact, by law, cannot communicate about those, correct? Exactly. That's what's called uncoordinated spending. You cannot coordinate if you're a campaign with these outside groups. That's a major federal fine if you do. And Google Ads, where else are they spending this money? Most of it really is on TV. And if you've been watching TV other than PBS, uh, I'm sure you've seen plenty of these ads and we'll probably see plenty more in these final days. And Andrea, about one third of the spending that we've seen in the uh, about one-fourth, actually, of the spending that we've seen in the Senate race was spent in the primary by one candidate, Will Carton, who didn't make it out of the Republican primary. What, what, what about that? Yeah, Will Carton loaned himself $8.8 .8 million in the primary. He is the Republican who lost to Jeff Flake. Now we have Jeff Flake and Democrat Richard Carmona running for the seat. So when Cardin loaned himself that money, and he spent most of it, um, he spent millions of dollars in that race that he lost. And his campaign has actually paid him back about uh, $2.6 million so far. Oftentimes when candidates make a loan to their campaign, they will try paying it back in the next coming months or years because they can still fundraise as long as their committee keeps up to date with its records and you know follows campaign finance laws. Campaigns committees can stay active for months and years past. So Cardin's campaign is still active, or, or the committee, I'm sorry, is still active, and he's paid himself back uh, about a quarter of what he put into that race. So he may be able to get more of his money back? He may, okay. yeah. And Christopher, Carmona is raising more money from individuals while Flake is raising more money from PACs. What does that tell us? It's interesting. In breaking down the numbers, just to give people an idea, Richard Carmona, in this period of time we looked at, raised about $2.6 million from individuals, and Jeff Flake raised about $1.8 million from individuals. They both have PAC money, and Flake's PAC money was not quite but close to double what Carmona had in PAC money, but they're still both under a million dollars in PAC money during this last time period. 
It's not surprising that Flake would have more PAC money because remember, he's a sitting member of Congress. He's been in the U.S. House for 12 years and PACs tend to give to known commodities. And as a member of Congress, Jeff Flake is a very known commodity where Richard Carmona is a newcomer. People know who he is, but we don't know how he'll vote and things like that necessarily. And let's move on to the uh, congressional races. First, Congressional District 1, Christopher, which you're covering uh, Democrat Ann Kirkpatrick, a former member of Congress, versus Jonathan Payton, a Republican and former state legislator. What's the spending looking like there? The spending, let's start with how much they raised, and then we'll get to the spending, actually. Kirkpatrick raised about $676,000 in the last few months. Payton raised $563,000, 564000 when it comes to the spending, Kirkpatrick spent almost $1.4 million, and Peyton spent about $860,000 over these last few months. Now, the spending figures you gave are much larger than the money they raised, but you're talking about cumulative fundraising over the year and that they're not going into debt necessarily, are they? Actually, these two do have debt. They also both have cash on hand. Uh, for example, at the end of this report, uh, Kirkpatrick still had $115,000 in the bank, if you will, and Peyton still had $70,000 in the bank. But they both do have debt, and this is as the end of the report. This may have been paid off in the last couple of days, um, but this isn't uncommon. Uh, Kirkpatrick has about 11000 in debt, and Peyton has about 60000 in debt. Sometimes those numbers can be a little misleading. It may be that a bill came in for yard signs or an ad and just hasn't been paid by the time the report was due, so that counts as debt. In the next report, you see that that debt goes away. So sometimes the debt can be a little misleading, but it could be loans and, and true debt also. Let's move on to Congressional District 2. Andrea, you're covering that race. Incumbent Democrat Ron Barber versus Republican challenger Martha McSally. What's the fundraising and the spending look like there? Well, on both counts, Ron Barber is, has more activity. He's raised more and he's spent more than McSally has. He brought in just shy of a million dollars, just short of a million dollars, $960,000. Again, this is from July, August, September, and a little bit of October. Martha McSally brought in about $641,000 in that same period. And uh, Ron Barber spent about $700,000. She spent about $600,000. So we're seeing a little bit of a difference there, but um, also they're, they're getting that money in and they're spending it. As, as Christopher said, if anybody's watching other stations, which we, of course, we'd like them to watch us. But uh, if they are watching other things, they're seeing ads for all these candidates. One thing we noticed in looking at their spending is how much they were spending in Arizona. And on that one, uh, Martha McSally has a bit of an edge. Of the numbers we looked at, she spent about $100,000 in Arizona to Ron Barber's about $67,000 spent in Arizona. And a lot of that is, you know, spending on consultants or some of the, the media that they're paying for, some of the ad production is happening out of state. Um, but a lot of the salaries, the people they're paying on staff, is in state. Now, Barber's campaign once in a while will brag about his fundraising, indicating that it's uh, a sign that he's more popular and probably will win the race. What's the truth in that? Is there really a corollary there? Well, candidates do like to say that. We often see when these fundraising deadlines come up, we often see people saying, touting how much money they've raised and saying that that shows their grassroots support. They have however many thousand individuals donating to them, and so that's, that shows that they're going to get the votes. Um, in some cases, it matters, especially when you've got maybe a candidate that can far outspend their opponent. But in this case, they're not so far apart that I think that's a clear determination of how the race is going to go. But it, remember, it's a, a, that is a district. Congressional District 2 has a, a tight voter registration. So I think we see voters from both sides looking at those messages that they're putting on TV. And then Congressional District 3, talking about one that has a decidedly different picture to it financially and otherwise, voter registration heavily favors the Democrat incumbent Raul Grijalva seeking his sixth term in Congress versus uh, two challengers, but the stronger one is the Republican uh, Gabriela Saucedo Mercer. What's the picture there? Well, as you said, there's a, diff there's a distinction in fundraising here, and we also see that the total dollar amounts being raised and spent in this district vary from, they're much lower from Congressional District 1 and Congressional District 2. Raul Grijalva brought in about $240,000 in the last uh, three months, three and a half months, 
and Gabriela Sacero Mercer brought in about eighty thousand dollars in the last few months. So um, there is a big distinction in spending there. They both ended that time with about forty-two thousand dollars on hand. So obviously Raúl Grijalva has spent through a lot more of that money than uh, Sacero Mercer has. Another thing we noticed is a, a big difference here in the PAC donations, the political action committees donating directly to the candidates. Uh, Sacero Mercer had about $8,000 in donations from those committees. Some of them were in Arizona, some of them were outside of Arizona, and uh, Grijalva had 90, about $98,000 from committees, so 98000 compared to 7000 he's getting more PAC support, which I think goes to your question about uh, the incumbency and, and the known candidate for the parties that are giving the money. And then, Andrea, speaking of PACs, you also looked into PAC spending in the state distinct from contributions to candidates, but including that, we're seeing PAC spending statewide at about $36 million at this point. Break that down a little bit for us. The biggest contributor of outside spending in Arizona are the campaigns for each of the parties. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which supports Democrats getting elected to Congress, and the National Republican Congressional Committee, which does the same for Republicans, are really weighing in on our congressional races and are um, the same party groups for the Senate race, too. We've seen a lot of outside groups in the Senate race. That's actually drawing the most uh, the highest spending from outside groups, as Christopher said, and I think as you mentioned, $19 million coming into that Senate race from outside groups. But in Congressional District 1, the National Republican Congressional Committee has spent $2.3 million, almost $2.4 million, um, opposing Democrat Ann Kirkpatrick in that race. On the other side, the Democrats have spent about $1.7 million opposing Jonathan Payton, the Republican in that race. We're also seeing Lower dollar amount spending, but both of those parties are weighing in on Congressional District 2. No outside spending in CD3 at this point. Uh, very quickly, Christopher, we have about 10 seconds. Jan Pack, Governor Jan Brewer's uh, PAC, is making donations. She is. Uh, she is uh, getting involved in CD1, uh, uh, the Cinema Parker race in Phoenix, Kirkpatrick. She spent about $252,000 around the state uh, opposing and supporting candidates. Christopher Conover and Andrea Kelly, political correspondents for Arizona Public Media, thank you for that report. All Ad Cash has helped produce a campaign that by one estimate means a 7 to 1 ratio of negative ads to positive. Is all that negativity having an effect? Will we see a return to civility in politics anytime soon? Here to discuss the issues are Thomas Volgia, University of Arizona political science professor and former mayor of Tucson, and Carolyn Lukensmeyer, Executive Director of the National Center for Civil Discourse at the U of A. Thanks for being with me. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Dr. Lukensmeyer, if blame is the right word, is all of this cash to blame for the tone we're seeing in the campaign? Well, I don't think there's any question, but the influx of money as a result of Citizens United has given both campaigns and all these super PACs the dollars necessary to buy many more television ads than we've ever seen before. And they are, in fact, more negative and more disinformation than has been typically true. And your reference to Citizens United was the U.S. Supreme Court decision a couple of years back that allows corporations and unions to contribute to political campaigns. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Volge, your thoughts on that? Are we seeing more negativity because there's more money available? I think we're seeing more negativity because there is more money available and you can target more with those commercials and you can do a lot more things with those commercials that is turned negative. But it's not just the money. Um, it's armies of consultants who tell you when to do negative commercials and when not to. It's both campaigns who have taken on negativity in a very dramatic way. Uh, it's feasible, it's possible, even with large sums of money, to be able to try to stop this. But at some point, when the cycle starts, it's very, very difficult for any of the sites to stop. And it builds a momentum of its own that becomes really vicious and really ugly. Now, you've been in politics a long time, Dr. Volge, and around politics. Ever seen it this bad? Um, it's never been this bad. Uh, four years ago, it, was never, it had never been that bad. And I think if this trend continues, we're going to be sitting here four years from now saying it's never been this bad. Uh, it has been getting really bad for uh, quite some time now. And the issues about civic discourse and about 
a positive approaches to politics is a lot of what citizens want to talk about, but can't because this overwhelming amount of negativity is, is getting in the way. I'd like to return to what the future will look like in two or four years and what could be done about that. But first, Dr. Lukensmeyer, let me ask you, are, are voters getting turned off by this? Do we see any evidence of voter fatigue as a result? There's no question about it. Weber Shandrick, who has been tracking issues of civility, both in governing and in campaign cycles, say that now we're up to literally 83% of Americans actually believe that the kind of incivility that we're seeing is part of why Congress cannot solve the major issues facing the country. So citizens actually, actually see a relationship between the money and incivility in campaigning and our inability to deal with immigration, to deal with climate change, to deal with the fiscal cliff. So unfortunately, what history shows is the more disgusted that citizens get with our politics, the more likely they are to disengage because they don't see positive ways to change it. They don't see how to impact a television station to stop the ads. So unfortunately, I think it is having a very negative impact on the voting population. And we'll probably see a lower, a lower voter turnout this year. And Dr. Volge, your thoughts? Well, you know, historically, um, negative campaigning was done to reduce voter turnout. And that would help one side or the other. Uh, there is something bizarre going on, though, this year, because there has been an enormous amount of negativity. And it doesn't look like voter turnout is going to go down very substantially. So there's, there's something very strange this time around where people are absolutely and totally disgusted with all this negativity, but they're not reacting the same way to it they used to before. If this was the olden days, which means 10 years ago in politics, um, I would have predicted that um, the turnout would be about 10% lower than it was four years ago, just because of the negativity dimension. It looks like it's going to be pretty much the same, maybe 2 3% lower. It does not look like the same reaction to negativity that we've had in previous campaigns. So, Dr. Lukensmeyer, are we becoming inured to this? You know... I was recently in Ohio, and Ohio is one of the states that literally tens of millions of dollars have been pushed into that state, not just at the presidential campaign, but the Senate campaign and several congressional districts. And I thought the most creative response I heard from a citizen was, I'm going to early vote, and I'm going to turn off all my devices. And he actually went on to say, given the way we are technologically intertwined now, there ought to be some way, once I, my household has voted, that the television and the internet knows that, and I don't see any more ads. I thought that was a pretty creative idea. To maybe, his... maybe we could do that with the mailbox, too, because there's a lot of direct <laughs> mail going on in True, that regard. Uh, True. Uh, Dr. Volge, uh, what do you expect the impact of all this will be for governance once the election is over? Well, I, I, I think there are two kinds of impacts. One that was just suggested earlier, which is that once you call people who you have to work with scum and slime and liars and cheats, it's really difficult to sit down with them across the table and formulate good public policy. Um, you tend to divide a lot more, you tend to be much more hostile, and uh, we're likely to see that hostility growing. But there's another effect, and it's the effect that we don't really talk about. And that's that a lot of good quality politicians, people in office, walk away from this process saying, I've had enough. I don't want to be any part of this. And what gets left are either newbies, people who do not understand what they're about to walk into, or some of the not so good people who stay in politics, who say, I, I can do this under any circumstances. And you see a lot of retirements, a lot of people walking away, a lot of people saying, I've had enough. I do not want to subject myself or my family, or to my friends, to this kind of public ridicule for nothing, because some of it is, or a lot of it is just simply made up. And that's a huge loss in our political system. Less than a minute remaining, Dr. Lukensmeyer, civil discourse, how do we bring that about? Well, one of the things that I think is good news is that some of the very excellent members of Congress that you were just speaking about actually want to do something about this. So the Institute is leading an effort 
to create a working group for a working Congress. And many members of the House who really respected Gabby Gifford's bipartisanship work and many efforts in the Senate who want to deal with the filibuster are really doing work right now, even before the election, to position themselves to see if we can't do something about the incivility in Congress. Carolyn Lukensmeyer, Executive Director of the National Center for Civil Discourse. Thomas Volge, Professor of Political Science here at the University of Arizona. Thanks for speaking with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having, for having us. us. Finally tonight, Arizona Secretary of State Ken Bennett on election preparations, early voting, and his voter turnout prediction. Ken Bennett, Arizona Secretary of State, thanks for speaking with me. Thank you, Michael. A little more than a week out from the general election, are we ready? I think so. We're uh, running around the state uh, testing all of the equipment that the counties are preparing to use. Each county has to test each piece of equipment that they plan on using. And then we come in uh, twice before each election and do a random selection of some of the equipment. And the counties have mailed us some blank ballots that could actually have been used in the election. And then we pre-mark them so that we know what the result will be, and they don't. And then we have them uh, select certain equipment. We run the ballots through, uh, just like it, it was election day. Uh, and if it comes up exactly correct, they can use their equipment. If not, we have to identify what, what is going wrong, and they have to either repair or replace the equipment. But so far, everything's worked out. And based on history, how often do those work out? Is it a pretty good percentage? Well, it has to work out every time. Uh, usually what we find if there is a minor discrepancy, and it's usually one or two votes, is that it's usually more of a human error thing where when somebody's feeding in the test ballots, they feed two in at one time or something like that. And so we can identify, we know how many ballots we have in the test deck and how many we're supposed to go through each machine. We go through and research all of that and find that usually somebody has put two in instead of one or something like that. So. We restart, and we have to get it down to exact, correct results before they can use that equipment in the machine, in the election. Three million or more people registered to vote in Arizona, and the breakdown is expected to be announced any day by your office. How many Republicans, how many Democrats, how many independents? But the trend has been toward more people registering independent and moving away from the two major parties, Republican and Democratic. What do you think accounts for that? Well, I think there's a lot of people that don't think of themselves as a pure Republican or a pure Democrat in the sense that, you know, very few people vote kind of a straight ticket. Uh, the, we've got an old election machine that's uh, probably eight feet wide and seven or eight feet tall and had the booth that you went in. It's got all these levers, and one of the levers used to be that you could just flip a lever for voting one party, and it would cast a ballot for everyone and only in that party, but I think very few people do that anymore. Very few. There's a lot of people that uh, find themselves uh, intrigued by uh, concepts that are not entirely <laughs> held within one party or another. And so, in the last, I think it was about a year and a half ago, the percentage of voters who identified themselves as not affiliated with either of the two major parties, or sometimes we call them independents. But some people think, well, I'm now in, in the independent party, but that's really not a party. It's just you're not affiliated with the other two. But that group uh, passed the Democrat Party registration in the state for the first time. And that independent group now is right at about 33 uh, percent. The Republicans are still at about 36 percent. And the Democrats as a group have uh, dropped to about 30. So, But I think it's just people who uh, want to vote for the, the person that they feel will do the best job, and sometimes that's a Republican, and sometimes that's a Democrat. Early voting has become a movement all of its own in Arizona and in many states. What are those numbers looking like this year? They've been on the rise over the course of time. Yes, they have been steadily rising, and I think at the last statewide election, uh, nearly two-thirds of Arizona voters voted by mail. Uh, a third of the voters uh, still uh, like to go to the polls, um, but I think this year we'll probably see the early voters or the mail-in uh, ballots uh, creep up a little bit more. I think we'll be somewhere in the two-thirds of the state, maybe approaching 70 percent, will vote by mail. 
that early voter phenomenon has changed the nature of political campaigning, but has it also changed the meaning of Election Day? Is Election Day less relevant now? Is it more of just a deadline than, well, than an event? Election Day is still Election Day, and it, um, it reminds, or I think I probably should take the opportunity to remind voters that even if you are mailing in your ballot, uh, the critical factor or deadline is that that ballot has to be in the possession of the recorder's office by 7 p.m. on Election Day. So it's not when you put it in the mail. You can't put it in the mail on Election Day. So we recommend to people that if they have received a ballot by mail, uh, to mail it no later than probably the Thursday before the election. Uh, if you get to the Friday or the weekend, or especially Monday or, or Tuesday election day, do not put a ballot in the mail. Just bring it to one of the uh, recorder's locations or a polling location. We still have, obviously, an election day, but the early balloting uh, has really created a, an election period where voters are casting their ballots 30 to 45 days before the election and up to election day. And so it's really created a new challenge for candidates to have to uh, try to contact voters much earlier than they used to have to. Arizona is focal point in the national uh, scene because of a U.S. Senate race and the hotly contested race and the hot contest to see which party controls the U.S. Senate. Uh, is that, plus the presidential race, plus a lot of important local races going to drive uh, turnout this year, do you think? Well, I think we will have a good turnout in Arizona. I don't know that we'll quite reach uh, what were almost record levels uh, four years ago when we had an Arizona uh, U.S. Senator, John McCain, um, on the top of the Republican ticket and the excitement related to President Obama's candidacy. Uh, but four years ago, we had about 78% turnout in the presidential election. So I think all of that is going to hopefully bring us close to that a uh, little bit above the 75% turnout level that we experienced four years ago. Everything you need to know about the issues and the candidates is on our website, azpm.org. Voting ends Tuesday, and we're planning complete coverage throughout the day, the evening, and all week long on PBS 6, NPR 89.1, and at azpm.org. That's our program for Friday, November 2nd, 2012. For Arizona Week, I'm Michael Chihad. Production of Arizona Week is made possible in parts by a grant from the Stonewall Foundation and by the members of Arizona Public Media. Thank you for your continued support.